Welcome to Around the NFL, presented by Barefoot Wines. From the Chris Wessling Podcast Studio, it's Around the NFL. I'm Dan Hans. It's got heroes here. Mark Sessler, Greg Rosenthal. A lot of people are going to be ignoring the Packers. They don't clean it up. Well, they're going to be. They, they could be deep into their off season come January, fill in the date. Blank. Yikes! Yikes! I'm not going to ignore. Him. Aaron Rodgers might be ignoring, you know, some of his teammates. Some of these comments. You know, yeah. Not yeah. happy. Absolutely, it's not. It's not a good time down there in Green Bay right now. Um, Greg, I'm happy you were able to wrap up the Monday Night Football recap uh, before we started the Tuesday this, uh, show today. This passive aggressive uh, <laughs> coming after Why me. Why is that passive aggressive? Well, you sent it a, was a you lengthy sent a text. Episode. You brought it. You sent a text with three question marks. I'm now enjoying my weekly text from Dan, where it's like 34 <laughs> minutes question mark question mark question mark for the recap. Well, I we think had fun. We had fun. I think a bit of a director's cut. Here's, yeah, here's the like most if, important if, thing. If you want to do it on Monday nights, so go do it. You know, <laughs> I'm extremely busy. I cannot do it, and I won't do it. But I, I, yeah. I think the most important thing is that. Yeah. Uh, and Mark, the product is good, and yeah. I'm sure it was with Bill Barnwell, who we Absolutely. love. And Greg. We built out a whole other segment because we thought the game might be a dud, right. but then uh, all the drama. I mean, I, that I was, was like a telenovela. I'll, I'll give you my personal experience yes. with it. Um, <laughs> I have a lengthier drive to right. get here than some. And, like, um, I got about um, 22 minutes into it. Uh, so and about a tenth of the way through the yeah, show. Yeah, I looked down. Yeah. And it, it was, was like 48 a, a, minutes. A fraction of it had been fi- – I was enjoying what I was listening to, yeah, but I didn't realize that it was essentially it. the podcast version of Gandhi. I – I don't – I want you to understand, Greg, I know it was good content. Yeah. And that's all that matters. It's all that matters. It will be our shortest show of the week. Though. Oh, I guess we got the Friday fun show. Maybe not. Oh, those have been getting longer, But too. I do like you're stretching out your legs. You're starting to get into this solo show vibe. I think I'm just – there's some breadcrumbs here, I guess, Mark. Yeah. yeah. Concerns about Greg feeling his oats a little bit. And it's I like would, Justin. You know, I, we worry about Justin – his head expanding with the success he's having behind the glass. Right, raging external yes. power. Just the typical producer breadcrumbs. I don't have. I have no concerns with Greg when it comes to um, <laughs> him becoming too uh, Greg focused on a Monday night and just going maybe two and a half hours next time and just discussing. Four forty-eight. We know. built in a, an extra segment thinking maybe the game would be a dud. And you know, Bill's an old friend, so if, when we get together, I love Barnwell. You know, Part of me is just jealous because I love yeah. talking football with Bill Barnwell. So make sure you check out the Monday night show. This is the Tuesday show. I yes. will let you know yes. early on in the episode, Greg tried to mention us, Dan and Mark, saying that we had texted you about the Patriots game after um, mm. with our vitriol around the Patriots and that Bill, Bill Barnwell said... I didn't said, say vitriol. Well, no, but yeah, you yeah. just... You're, but Bill you're Barnwell enjoying said the that Patriots you, loss. He said that you and I have great opinions. Oh, yeah. that's nice. So yeah. right away, he became my favorite person on the episode. Yeah. So the episode peaked very early on. Yeah. Yes, then it was just you know snowball rolling downhill. Yeah, like uh, if the Jets lose, we have to act like we lost one of the members of our family. <laughs> <laughs> Don't speak about it. But in the second the Pats lose, like, what's yeah. Johnny Chuckles See, over here? Greg is going to be firing <laughs> arrows for the rest of the episode. He started right. it that yeah. way. It's he always, wanted it. He wanted it. I come at Greg Yeah. about uh, – Three to four minutes pass, and yeah. then the the arrow comes yeah. back at me. Then I catch a stray well, because actually, I'm in the room. It's been like four hours since he sent that text. Fifty-three <laughs> minutes, exclamation, exclamation. So that's been sitting in there. Let's let's um <laughs> let's just move on. Let's Please. try. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's we do have a guest on. that's waiting. A great guest. And 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 by the way, the part of the I was surprised by how much I was enjoying that thumping of the pages. So I really don't have animosity toward the team, but I think it was just whatever was lingering inside. It just was kind of cool to see the Pats getting waxed at home in a prime time after two decades of the other thing happening. And I found it very interesting uh, before we get to the news and we're going to do uh, some trade deadline talk with a very special guest and a TNF preview that Peyton and Eli on the Manning cast, especially Peyton, very vocal about the Bears going in for that final score with uh, under a minute to go to get it to 40 to yeah. make a statement against the Patriots in New England, which – and Eli nodding his head in agreement. Like, the Manning <laughs> boys still trying to take it to Belichick all these years later. They should have. I, I thought that was an interesting moment because I thought Belichick would probably do it. So, do it back. I mean, oh, Eli's Eber taking Flus it was, to the – Eberflus was kind of kissing. How many? Right there. Eli's how many taking burgers? it to your little Patriots twice, Greg. If you remember, if you recall NFL history. Are you talking about forty-two and forty-six? That's what I'm talking about. All right, let's do some news. That scene, Yo. Vince, is the number two best football scene according to NFL.com. You got beat out by fast times at Richmond High. Are you disappointed about this? 
Well, you know, sadly, it's another thing that NFL.com is wrong about, and uh, they're just kind of <laughs> adding to their list at this point. <laughs> it's Vince Vaughn, the actor. <laughs> Vince Vaughn with NFL.com <laughs> takes. That is not, uh, not expected. Uh, uh, an arrow at NFL.com. And I would. Uh, that sounds like an Adam Rank article. I can't check because... Well, I don't. I need more context. I don't know yes, what they were talking about. They were about talking or... about the greatest movie scenes of all time. Okay. And um, Vince Vaughn, who was in Rudy, he was on that list, beaten out uh, by... Um, who is the actor from Fast Times that goes crazy on the football field when they uh, destroy his car? That movie's 100 years old, but anyway. Sean Penn was in it, I believe. I'm pretty – yes, it, yes, he yeah. was. Uh, Spicoli. Um, but anyway, Vaughn takes a shot. I think Rank wrote that article. But we, there's put no way rank. to know. Just put it on Rank. Because at some point, <laughs> wow. our company just wiped rank. just wiped rank. the data of any author for articles that were written – from 2010 to about 2020. Right. It looks like we were unemployed for a decade plus. Right. Our, right. Essentially, our, our life's work yeah. wiped away with a, 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 a just a touch of the backspace stroke. The opposite of noble. <laughs> you know who is noble? Our guest. Yeah, if you're sitting through these last seven minutes. <laughs> Mike Garofolo, the man, the myth, the legend. I, I didn't have a choice. <laughs> right. <laughs> And Mike, uh, I don't know if you caught Vince Vaughn on the Manning cast, but, you know, I'm watching it. And even with the NFL.com dig, um, I'm like, man, Vince Vaughn, that is a dude. I want to hang out with that dude. And then he calls the Bears home stadium Soldiers Field. And I was like, damn it, these actors in Hollywood, they're not like us. Mm. <laughs> Vince Vaughn? Called Soldier Field, Soldiers Field. I mean, he's a Chicago guy, right? I know. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's well, you know. Could that's it, the one he should get right. I mean, at this point, <laughs> he's been out here for 30 years, so he's lost his touch. Uh, well, but it was Soldier Chicago. Field before he left. Okay, Nothing you're right. I, mean, I don't know why I'm trying to excuse this. He... Yeah, probably a variety of substances flowing through the bloodstream. <laughs> well, see, now you're going in a place that maybe <laughs> isn't fair. Um, all right, Mike, we got to have you on. You're one of the great insiders in our league, so uh, we're going to hit up some trade deadline talk with a deadline coming up next week. But first, let's do some news. And if Mike's available and he's happy enough, or maybe not happy, yeah. but <laughs> nice enough to come on our show, let's do some news with Mike Garofolo. What the hell? Let's start with Matt Ryan, the big news that came down on Monday that Matt Ryan will be benched for the duration of the 2022 season. Um, after a turnover plague start to the year, Sam Ellinger takes over, and the plan is for Ellinger to the finish the year, a former six-round pick uh, who has never started a game, a preseason superstar, though. Mike, uh, this was on Monday as I'm putting together power rankings, and that pops up in the inbox. I'm like, whoa, that was a stunner. Yeah. For somebody that's plugged in like you, Mike, was that stunning to see them go in this direction? Yeah, it was because – the revolving door that we've seen there, and, and after it, it happened, uh, I heard from many a folk, agents and, and, and team-wise, who are kind of snickering at it, um, to be honest with you, which uh, they all have their reasons for what doing What about it. the snickering? Uh, like, but, in what way? What are they snickering about? Well, I think some folks have had some dealings with the, the, the Colts uh, who were not thrilled about it, and uh, some folks hmm. who are rivals of the Colts who are reveling in the fact that they can't find the long-term solution at quarterback <laughs> ever since Andrew Luck walked out the door unexpectedly. But that, the most in, the shocking part is what you see on your screen, which is that they're still a 500 team, right? If you were 2-4-1 and one, and you're on the wrong side of 500, you start to get a little bit desperate and do some things. But... Um, we're, we were just a few days removed from Jim Irsay at the league meetings telling Ian Rappaport that Matt Ryan's leadership ranks up there with Peyton Manning. So it was just, <laughs> how do we go from that to, eh, let's give all Elinger, Elinger. Is it Elinger or Elinger? I never know. Elinger, I, I think. Elinger. Right Elinger. 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 So <laughs> it is C, none of the above. Thank you. So which is, one, which one are we, Elinger? Elinger. E. Okay. Do we I'll think have though, that down by yeah. Sunday. There's other reporting out there that there, this might have had to do with the fact that if Matt Ryan, who's you know already been hurt and were hurt more seriously, would have he has 12 million guaranteed next year, and they don't probably want him to be their quarterback next year, but he yeah. would have an injury guarantee if he didn't pass a physical by March that would trigger another 17 right. million dollars into next year's contract mm. for a guy that might not be in the NFL. So is this Oof. a thing where if they cut him at some point and a quarterback needy team in a playoff race picks him up, they take that contract and away me, from him? Let me add to that because it goes back to who's signing 
the paychecks. There are also reports out there that there are some breadcrumbs that are leading right up to the owner's door, Greg. Well, our, our friend Zach Kiefer from The Athletic reported yeah. it pretty extensively that, you know, Ursay was heavily involved in the process. And that certainly seems to make sense, Greg, considering uh, this is the type of move that seemingly came out of nowhere, and we know what's going on with the frustration with Ursay and that whole organization. A little messy here. Yeah, I, and uh, again, people should check out that article, Zach Kiefer, who we've had on the show a few times. It, it was interesting because they indicated Ursay and Ballard were maybe pushing for this even earlier than it happened, and that is kind of reflected in the Frank Wright comments that he didn't want to do it too soon. I think one, one part that's a little lost in this is I believe that they believe Sam Ellinger it might be something. And he played fantastic in the preseason. And the preseason is not a great indication, but they were feeling themselves some Sam Ellinger in the preseason. And I think they're doing this because they think Ellinger has a better chance to save Chris Ballard and Frank Reich's job. They wouldn't do it otherwise. They know they're on the hot seat, I mean, right? That is right, risky. Mike? That's risky. Don't you think, Mike, that they, they think he's a better chance to win than, than Matt Ryan? And they know their jobs are on the line. Yeah, um, first of all, let's clean up the, the injury stuff uh, for next year. So he has $19 million in, in uh, injury-only guarantees mm. at the sign of con- uh, this time of signing the deal. Uh, $12 million for skill and cap. Uh, so it's, it's a little hairy as to what, you know, you start to cut a guy. Is, are you cutting him because of skill? Well, that's supposed to be guaranteed. Uh, then there's another $7 million skill cap if he's on the roster the third day of the league year in March. So... Um, it's, it's, it's a little, it's a little hairy. There's an injury only guarantee, uh, on the $10 million roster bonus that he has due next year. So there's, there's some injury elements. There's some skill elements. There's a lot of elements at play for Matt Ryan. Uh, but I've heard nothing but glowing reviews of our buddy Ellinger since he's arrived there. And, uh, their thoughts about him being a potential starting quarterback, nailed it. Potential (laughs) starting quarterback in the NFL moving forward. It's just, it's, it's. It's a ready-made compete roster that he walked into, and they haven't competed. And, and Reich's comments were similar to what he was saying about Carson Wentz when they moved on, about how he stuck his neck out for him and he didn't really deliver. And Matt Ryan, like, we haven't been good enough. We haven't lived up to expectations and promises. I'm paraphrasing. I forget the uh, exact phrasing right now. But, uh, yeah, I mean, listen, there's... I, I, it's not like Frank Reich was sitting there saying, no, we absolutely have to continue to start this guy. If it was decided from above him, he certainly didn't put uh, push back uh, right. with he regard to that he decision. Stood it's his still ground. his team. He could have stood his ground yeah. if he really believed in Ryan. In other news, yes, the, a lot of bad news. Uh, confirmed by Robert Sala, Jets head coach on Monday. Brees Hall, uh, who looked like a offensive rookie of the year. Brees Lightning. Uh, don't be so excited, Sessler. Oh. Is out for the season uh, with an ACL mm-hmm. tear. Elijah Vera Tucker, their do-it-all offensive lineman and probably the second best player on their offense, potentially. Also out for the year with torn triceps. Got any cute nickname for that to s- quietly celebrate my team's demise? <laughs> All these players so, will be back in time, and I really like Brees Hall. I was great. not a shot at I think at that you. was supposed to be uh, pumping up his uh, talent. Correct, correct. It was a, The timing right. might have been poor. A little bit off on the timing. That was also an Iron Eagle joint. Um, but anyway, James Robinson acquired in a trade as the Jets pivot for a day three uh, conditional pick. Uh, Mike, my feeling as a Jets fan, and yes, uh, I, was, I was taking some heat a little bit earlier that I was in my feelings about the Jets, but that's I'm a real fan, and that's how I feel when, they, when these injuries happened. I feel like it lowered the ceiling on this Jets season a little bit. Doesn't mean the season's lost because there's still a lot to be gained in terms of development and me- maybe even winning four or five more games and breaking that playoff drought. But the why can't us mentality, to me, it kind of the, the window closed there. Am I right or am I wrong? With regard to why can't you make the playoffs, you think that's Well, why that's can't we not just make the playoffs, um, but in a, a weird NFL landscape where I know there yeah. are two juggernauts in the AFC, why can't the Jets go berserker mode in January if yeah. things continue to uh, coalesce, if you will? Uh, I don't necessarily feel that anymore. Here's what I, here's what I like. Um, you're sending a message that we're not just sitting here and waiting anymore, right? Like okay. we made – the, the move at general manager, we made the, made the move at head coach. We have stockpiled 
uh, draft picks that we feel really good about and the young nucleus that's coming together. Uh, we are not panicking, and I know we're going to get to Elijah Moore, I think, in a second. We're not panicking when multiple wide receivers are, are, are saying we want out of here. We're not going to let them go because we still believe in them and we still believe in what we're building right here. Um, and you may not make the playoffs, but we're sending a message that we're not giving up on the season. We're doing everything we want we can to stay competitive. Um, and the other thing I love about it is these general managers tend to hold on to these draft picks um, as if they were made of gold. And they wind up drafting guys in the sixth round that don't even make the roster coming out of training camp. And it drives me nuts because why not take a more proven commodity that you've already seen on the, NF, uh, on the field in the NFL in James Robinson? And I know that the Jets did their homework with regard to this knee soreness that Doug Peterson was referring to because Robinson had no carries on Sunday um, despite playing, I think it was 12 snaps. Um, so, I, you know, they checked that out and said they were good with the medical. So we believe in the player. We believe in the medical. Let's bring this guy in and show everybody that we're here to compete. And uh, we're not just trying to be a feel-good story. We're actually trying to be a good story and trying to be a good team. That's what this was all about for the Jets. And you know what? We'll, we'll, we'll track who comes out of that six-round pick. Maybe it'll be a five, depending on Robinson's performance. Uh, but if the guy doesn't make the opening day roster, regardless of where James Robinson is next year, I'm good with it, and I love the aggressiveness by Joe Douglas. I'm with you there. I, I totally agree with what Mike just said. And, I, Dan, I, I wish you were not as down as you are about the Jets. I get that it's been a rough week, but every team that gets to January – is going to go through weeks like this and lose key players. And it makes them have to respond to it. And if anything, I love the way that Joe Douglas responded. I think James Robinson, if he's healthy, is going to be a perfect addition to a team that needs him. And if Urban Meyer didn't like James Robinson, then you know he's good. <laughs> <laughs> right. Two players, like, it's a devastating week for them, but they haven't been winning because of offense. Anyways, and you just look around the league, everyone's missing really important players to them and they are now unfortunately kind of in that mix but 10 15 20 teams uh, are missing five six seven starters and uh, i think that what the jets have shown is they might have uh the intestinal fortitude especially on defense that, the that it's not gonna <laughs> affect it that's the beautiful thing about football that's it, the it term stinks, but it's only two players and i hate to do this you know because <laughs> certainly teams were looking at the jets five weeks ago and saying well there's a winnable game so it's it's hard to do this but you start to look at the schedule, New England twice in the next four weeks. Suddenly not as daunting as maybe you thought it was before. Buffalo's in there. Okay, at least that game's at home. I can't wait to actually see that. That'll be a nice litmus test for this team. Chicago, Detroit, Jacksonville at home. You're at Seattle. That should be an interesting game. I mean, how many wins did you say? Four or five more, Dan? Yeah, get yeah. me to They're nine there or to ten. be had. Yeah. James Robinson gives the Jets the Jaguars playbook. This is this is how bizarre, by Robinson the way, the revenge game. There you go. That's how bizarre the schedule is. I saw a tweet yesterday that uh, DVOA, the Jets have the hardest remaining schedule in the league. But then Mike goes through that, and it's like that's not hard. But everything's the same. <laughs> it's so confusing out well, here in our league. Listen, it, it, we're, we're like, this is the flattest plateau across the league that I can ever remember. I did an interview last week. I think it was Philly Radio, and they were like, you know, do you consider the Eagles, Bills, and Chiefs to be like that upper echelon? I was like, I consider the Bills to be the upper echelon. Uh, that's the complete team. Outside of that, I'm telling you, it's flatland. I thought the Rocky Mountains would be a lot rockier than this. That John Denver was fl – I can't finish that line. <laughs> almost, almost. Uh, speaking of the Patriots, uh, Bill Belichick taking some fire after their blowout loss to the Bears on Monday night about how he handled his quarterbacks. Mac Jones lasted just three series, I believe, before Bailey Zappi entered, led a couple touchdown drives, and then they went radio silent again. So what didn't seem like a controversy now definitely feels like a controversy, and here's what old Billy Boy had to say after the game. And and if if as you move forward, if if he's healthy, Bill, is he is it fair to say if he's healthy, Mac Jones. he's the starter? Uh, again, th uh, that's a hypothetical question. So let's, let's see, you know, where that is and what that is. Got to give Mike Reese credit from ESPN. He knows how to ask the, it in the perfect way that'll make Belichick have to think for the longest time where he gives a non-answer. <laughs> I saw, I saw something after the game, Mike, where they were like, 
oh man, Bill Belichick, he opened up this can of worms and now he's going to have to answer to what's going on at this quarter. No, he doesn't. <laughs> Bill doesn't have to do anything and he won't. But how about this situation now in uh, New England? Hasn't answered anything in 25 years, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. Um, the situation in New England, I, I don't, I mean, listen, it's Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, they're talking about it right now. I, I spoke to some folks this morning who said, you know, frankly, it was up to the last uh, couple of hours of the game last night before I ever got a read that this rotation that we were hearing about, and I, you know, I'll give you a little inside the insiders uh, material here. Mm. I, I crushed Pelissero and Rappaport because they were on air yesterday and they were tiptoeing around it and alluding to it. And I think Rappaport, who's covered the Patriots closely, has some scars from his years of, you know, reporting something about the <laughs> Patriots and then it not happening in large part because maybe Belichick was just trying to spite the media. I mean, he literally um, so told the halftime kinda... reporter Mac Jones was coming back in and that, that was a lie. Yeah. Like that was on the record. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I think Rappaport put a toe in the water. And then right before the game when Joe Buck mentioned it, I was like, I can't believe you guys wussed out on this one. Come oh, on. That's a you could have had the glory in this one. So they kind of alluded to it. But we, we were kind of hearing it all day. And we were checking with folks. And, you know, a few hours before the game, it was like, well, we haven't heard from Bill about the final plan for things. Uh, so right now you're kind of getting that same read when we're five days out from the game. So uh, we'll see as the week goes on. But, I, you know, look, it, 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 I thought it was very poignant that Zappi came in the game, had those two drives where the Bears kind of were like, whoa, wait a minute, what, what, where did this come from? And then adjusted number one, but number two also kept the lead. I thought that was huge for Chicago and a huge detriment to the Patriots because their plan coming into that game was to run the heck out of the ball. Well, when you're playing from behind and now Bailey Zappi's got to sit back there, and I know he's listed as 6'1", but his height at the combine was 6004, which means he's closer to 6 than he is to 6'1". And I know that coming into the, the, the draft, everybody down, says, well, yeah. there's short quarterbacks. Well, that's fine. Russell Wilson, Kyler Murray, if you can move – to create throwing lanes, that's one thing. But if you're Bailey Zappi last night and you're just going to sit back there in the pocket and have to throw down after down, it's going to be batted pass. It's going to be deflected pass just like you saw last night. So that's why he wasn't a one, uh, a day one or day two draft pick. It's because the measurables aren't there. So, uh, you know, if, if, if I'm the Patriots, I, I thought, and nobody's told me this. Nobody's told me this. This was my theory based on how they were handling this one. I think it was an open competition, or at least that's the way it was supposed to be last night. Let's see who can win the job, as if it's the preseason, as if it's training camp. That is just my theory about what is happening in Bill Belichick's head, but I think it's a pretty good theory, but then again, it's mine, so of course I believe that. <laughs> Belichick said after one of the early Zappy starts, uh, something along the lines of, when he comes off the field, what he sees is what I saw. It's almost like saying me and Zappy kind of we're kind of bros. And then there's these you used reports. Used to say that about Brady in 2000. Sure, there's these reports. Um, you know, they haven't bubbled up to become something you know totally tangible. That Mac Jones was a little nonplussed, obviously, during the summer. Uh, a little maybe not feeling like he was a great fit in the Matt Patricia new scheme, and that he's not a malcontent, but he hasn't totally been like on board. Where Zappy's probably just following orders. Do you think there's maybe a tone shift inside the building with Belichick and fill in the blank other assistant coach saying Mac Jones is sort of annoying us right now. Zappy does what we say. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I haven't heard the word annoying, so I'd have, I'd have trouble kind of backing that. But I, I, I do think he's affected, and I think I saw that myself last night. And it's hard to ha hear all those people chanting How could you not for the be? other guy when you're, yeah, well, you're coming back from an injury, too. It's not like, you know, granted, he didn't play great before that. But, you, you, you know, the other guy played <laughs> he well handled because it well, you were down with a high ankle Yeah, sprain. he was a first-round well, pick who played great as a rookie. They went to the playoffs, and suddenly he's all but getting booed off the field for – for doing nothing it was yeah. the, I actually think it was a really Spoiled. it shows how sports radio kind of impacts thing because I think all this Mac Jones whispering and some misreporting and some bad reporting and some speculative reporting I think is why those fans were booing for the most part and everyone's into zappy let's take a break yeah. here the question is no, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say the question is real quick can you get that confidence back can mm -hmm. you get the guy playing like he did last year can you get sure. a little swag going uh, we'll see that seemed to be missing uh, certainly in his limited time on Monday night. Let's take a break here and then talk some trade deadline stuff with Mike Garofolo. All right, we're back. 
Mike, <laughs> thank you again for joining us. The trade deadline is November 1st. So let's let's talk to a guy who knows about the deadline. We've already seen uh, two prominent running backs moved, including a superstar in Christian McCaffrey. Uh, but let's start by talking some wide receivers that could be changing uniforms ahead of the deadline. Uh, let's start down in Houston with Brandon Cooks. What are you hearing on Cooks? This is the most fascinating career arc of all time, I think, <laughs> because he's one trade away from tying Eric Dickerson uh, for the all-time number of times being traded. Uh, what's really interesting to me is this would be another time in which he got a contract extension, a paid a pay raise, and then got traded. And the Texans' <laughs> pay raise, I don't remember the specifics of it. They gave him a pay raise for, for no reason. Like, I can't even – it wasn't even like, oh, his contract was co- – like, he just got a bump with no years added just because – we love this guy. It was like a sorry and for all the trades bump, and then let's trade you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a – I'm trying – there was something about maybe he was going to get moved or something like that. I think they got caught with their hand in the cookie jar. I, I, I'm forgetting the details. But <laughs> 36 the he, million he fully getting, guaranteed. <laughs> yeah, but because – here was the other thing. Yeah, it, he's never been – since he signed the extension with the Rams, A, he's never been on a year that wasn't fully guaranteed, I believe, if I'm remembering these details, number one. And number two, because – because of the pay bump from the Texans, he wound up making more than what was initially written into the contract for the Rams, which is incredibly rare. Again, no years were added. Like, you could do an extension and add some years, fine, whatever. But, like, no extension or no years added. And usually players make less, right? You get cut before the end of the contract. (laughs) This guy made more before the end of the contract. I want his agent. And usually, Um, if if you get traded this much, or whether, whatever the sport is, it might might be a signal if you can play, but you keep moving. It might be a knucklehead. Well, we've never heard anything negative about Brandon Cooks. He's just that guy that he's right at that line where he's movable. And, and I'll add this. Uh, after all the teams that traded him, which is now three, right? I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's Houston. I'm sorry. It's uh, uh, the, the, te- the Saints, the Patriots Rams. And the Patriots. And then the Patriots, yes. All the teams that traded him expressed regret to his people after that and or tried to get him back after that. So it's like, <laughs> again, the, the oddest, it's not like, well, boy, whew, former, never got rid of that guy. Former guest of yeah. this uh, very program. Uh, nice young man. Yeah, if you if you just uh, what, all right, Grandpa. What, I just mentioned. I'm just what saying that's like about? his reputation. What a nice like, young man. You know, he's he's a very See? he's a quiet guy. He's a God fearing man, and he's uh, respected in the yeah. locker room. Good. That's his identity. He has six 1,000 yard seasons. If you were just measuring a man's career by 1,000 yard seasons, great player. Brandon Cooks is up there. Wait, I I'm confused though. Why? I, I guess the Texans could use more draft picks, but, man, they've had a lot of draft picks. They could use good players, so that part is a little confusing to me. It's like they have yeah, no one Yeah, I think they're receiver. a little disappointed. Oh. I, yeah. I know they're a little disappointed in how they've started. They felt like their record was going to be better at this point, yeah. and maybe if they close out that week one game. They weren't uh, alone. Uh, this the podcast, Colts. these two guys next to me are talking to, about them like they were the 2007 Patriots. That's, uh, no, we I said they're going to get over four and a half. And I, they still have a chance. But I find them to be great. slightly delusional if they thought they were going to have a winning record right now or something. Come on, slow, well, slow the boat Here's down my question. Yeah. <laughs> here's my question, Greg. Does, does, the, does the tie count as a half? No, oh, no, no, that counts as nothing. So uh, they have had fourth quarter Kissing leads. Oh. Many weeks they've had fourth quarter leads, but they don't finish let's, the game. Let's move to Pittsburgh. Yeah, and the Bears, <laughs> hold on, the, the Bears game, they threw that interception to uh, Roquan exactly. Smith, which was just a backbreaker. Got bad, bad, bad. Let's move to Pittsburgh where you know what Pittsburgh does. They keep drafting wide receivers, and they move on from wide receivers. They drafted George Pickens and Calvin Austin in the spring, and you know, some speculation that this could be the end for Chase Claypool. What are you hearing on that? Big body guy. You know, Cooks. Cooks is the is the downfield threat that I, I a couple. I, I know Tampa feels like they haven't had since they lost Antonio Brown. They'd love to have that guy that could really make teams fear what's going down. So maybe they'd be in play for you know. This is more of a big body guy. Middle look. I mean, there it is, right there. There's the physicality on display, right there. Um, I, I know that coming in that they had higher expectations for what he was going to do uh, from a production standpoint in Pittsburgh. The question is, how much of it is him? How much of it is, um, you know, what's happening around him and the fact that you've got two quarterbacks trying to find their way? 
um, and Matt Canada's offense, which I know has been under question. I still think Matt Canada's got some good ideas and good schemes. They just got to make sure that they can all run it uh, as an entire offense. They haven't gotten there to this point. So I know there's teams nosing around Claypool. I, I think that they probably expected, you know, an easy pry away from the Pittsburgh Steelers, mm. and that has not been the case to this point. Now this Pittsburgh bluffing, and they lo- wind up lowering their – their price right before the uh, the deadline next week. We'll see. I, they've got one more year of. Uh, uh, he was drafted in 2000, so uh, 2020, so 2021, 20, 22, 23. They got one more year of him under contract. Uh, so there's no great rush to have to do this right now if you're the Pittsburgh Steelers. Who do you think's like the most likely of these receivers to go? You know, you could throw Jerry Judy, Jerry in Judy yeah. in there because that does seem to be the position. When you look at the Ravens, uh, when you look a- mm. around the league, that I-, I feel like would be in the highest need, and is is the position I think you can just see guys fitting into, and especially Baltimore, like that you just need an extra pair of hands. The Rams need an extra pair of hands. The Packers need an extra pair of hands, and that these guys are talented enough they could fit in. Who do you think is like the most likely to go? Would it be Judy? Yeah, I, yeah, very well, maybe Judy because. Um, he's that that's a previous regime right that's a previous regime draft pick which is always uh something you look at um as a potential hey we're going to part with this guy because I, I didn't i didn't draft this guy um so that's a that's a strong possibility um it's they're not going to give him away that's for sure and the other thing about judy is his production while russell wilson was in there was like three catches a game he goes out and he's the guy that wound up catching the most balls for brent rip and was up close to 90 six yards or uh, five catches for 96, if I'm remembering his stat line correctly. So now all of a sudden is it, okay, maybe this guy's been underperforming because the quarterback has been underperforming. Well, we'll see about that. I, I, you know, it's, it's a former first round pick. So you're still going to have to come up and, 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 and pay for this guy. It's going to have to be some kind of day two compensation in my mind. So um, like a second. That, yeah. That's a guy that, Really, what's that's the, the, guy po- what's really the point of flourish. trading? Yeah, don't trade him for they're both anything spicy less to me. Claypool and Judy, like Cooks, you know what he is, and that's a good thing. Um, Claypool right. and Judy, this seems like there's a high ceiling if you put him in the right environment, you might end up with a superstar. But I'm sure the, the current teams have been disappointed overall with the outpoint, well, uh, with the output. And Judy coming out of training camp, it was all about oh, Cortland Sutton's gonna have a monster year, Jerry Judy. And, you know, which is another reason why I I did not hear glowing reviews about what was happening with him in training camp. So it doesn't sound like the coaching staff was in love with him. Again, it's not uh, George Payton's guy. So that's why when you ask me who's most likely, I think it's Judy. But somebody's really going to have to come with some compensation here to get him away. We all remember that it was Mike G who was early to the Odell Beckham Trade away from New York to Cleveland way back when. P- oh, like, people still talk about. It. They, they still were just, talk about that. We were that. talking about it in the newsroom earlier today. I, I will ask you about another um, receiver on the level of Odell Beckham. Uh, not at all. But Elijah Moore. <laughs> is there any chance he is shipped out of uh, Florham Park? Uh, I'm going to say that I believe Joe Douglas and I believe Robert Sala, uh, and I'm going to say that no, he is not traded um, now. <laughs> I did find it interesting that all Elijah tweeted um, today about persecution. <laughs> this was great. Did oh, you see no. this tweet yet, no, Dan? No, I didn't. What uh, is it? So Elijah <laughs> tweeted today a, a biblical <laughs> reference with the, word, with the caption, thank you. And he said, uh, oh, here it is. Okay. It's persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. It's a Corinth, uh, second oh letter to the Corinthians. And it says, if you're truly living for the Lord, the Lord, you can expect to encounter persecution. The first reply uh, was from a gentleman, uh, T, who said, brother, don't bring Jesus into you quitting on your team. Uh, 293 <laughs> likes and counting on uh, all T's tweet. Yeah. Uh, Elijah Moore, and I mentioned, now, now let, me, let me back this up. because I know like Elijah second Moore tweet to the Corinthians, but okay, that's fine. Yeah, second tweet. <laughs> Are they tweeting back then? I don't know. Um, Twitter's been around for a while. Uh, here, here's the deal about Elijah Moore, and I mentioned this on air on game day morning on Sunday. Uh, he received a red star, and I know it's going to sound like some grade school stuff, so let me just explain this the right way. You grade guys during the draft process with whatever, however you do it. He got a red star, which is the highest grade that you can receive uh, for the Jets for character, and that's how highly they think of Elijah Moore and why – 
they think that because he's frustrated, once the trade deadline passes, that they think that this is a guy who's going to be able to come back into the fold and realize this is where I am. This is where I'm going to be. So let me just get back to working as hard as I possibly can, nose to the grindstone and uh, not requesting trades uh, and, and, and rocking the boat. Yeah, I'm not. The other thing that they've yeah, told him, yeah. they, what they've told him is we've got a young offense, right? We've got young targets. We've got a young quarterback. We have young guys on the offensive line. We are going to gel as an offense. And by the way, we're winning games in the meantime, but we're going to gel as an offense. The catches are coming. The yards are coming. The touchdowns are coming. This is a guy who's friends with DK Metcalf, Odell Beckham. Uh, there's somebody else he's really close with. All guys who have AJ put up a ton Brown. of yards. He, he has the same AJ agent Brown. as uh, all go. the guys who got yes. traded. <laughs> yes. Right. That yes. asked for trades. Very good point. Very good point and, and pertinent to the conversation. But the Jets are telling him, like, our situation doesn't compare to them. Not yet, anyway. And now you're starting to see coverage shift toward Garrett Wilson and all these other. You're going to eat one of these days, but you got to come in and you got to be in the fold and you got to be locked in. And you may help spring this offense. Yeah. So I think he stays. That's, that's Does my... he ever perform? I don't know. The Jets never break their promises. Uh, what is with the Jets digs today? What? Just it's a top... relax we... with the Jets digs. It's a topical uh, um... topic. They're five and two. Things are going pretty right. well overall. I will silence me. But um, I think with Elijah Moore, I'm a little disappointed, uh, but I'm not killing him like these other Jets fans out there. He's a young guy, and it has been frustrating because he's so good. He's so talented. Just let it play out. And guess what? With Brees Hall out, there's going to be more passing potentially with this offense. There might have to be to go where it needs to go. Anything else, uh, Mike, before we say goodbye that's jumping out to you that you're hearing? Anything percolating? Uh, see, this is the, the. Can I give you some the teams then? The, Can I give you some teams that are? Will wait, they I want to hear what Mike had to say there. <laughs> okay, I thought he was Greg. Yeah, Greg. I wasn't going to give you a whole lot because this is the part of the insidery now that like yeah. you don't just report like what you're hearing. You kind of like yeah. If your source tells you like yeah, that's a thing, but just just shh, and we'll, mm. if it happens, I'll let right. you know. That's like, why I wanted that, to give which like Ian. Yeah, Ian got a read on that James Robinson thing and was like, I'm not saying a word until it pops mm. and was able to break it cleanly. Sometimes you get burned because of this. But Mike yeah. G is sitting All right, on let's something. go like some, some rapid fire there. Like, do you think the Browns will be sellers? I look at I look at some of those player clowny. John Johnson especially. The Rams might want back. Uh, Kareem Hunt. That's a tough contract Panther, to take on, though. Panthers. How about Bradley Chubb in Denver? Like, that's an all-pro type of player on the final year of his contract. Is it an all-pro type of like this year? He's, yes, he's been this year. Good. Yes, I mean this year. Yes, yeah, that's yeah, what I mean. He's better. playing great this yeah. year. Like he's someone okay. like a, right. like yeah. a Von uh, Miller. You come in and you actually have an impact. Just trying to think who's actually going to be sellers. Everyone's yeah. in a playoff race. The well, Browns make a little sense to I, me just because of their front office and where they're at. Well, I thought the Brown, uh, the uh, the Bears might be your sellers, especially if they lost that game to Robert New England. Quinn. They would have been uh, what two and two and five, right? Robert Quinn. And uh, you know, Roquan, certainly that, that hasn't materialized from a contract standpoint. He is so good, by the way. It's unbelievable. How, like, he's just been on display. And I give him all the credit in the world because he's not happy with the business side of things, but he's performing on a team that I don't think we're still expecting to make the playoffs. But I thought if they lose that game, now they fall to 2-5 and five instead of 3-4. and four, And now it's like, okay, now we can sell off parts. I, I, maybe early. that's still the case. Trade deadline Next still week too we early. see. Uh, you th- wh- 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 how late can we put it though? Because you got to get these guys that get in have to learn playbooks. Week twelve, why not? Mid November. Why, why is it? What's the problem? January. I don't really get it. Like every other sport go- does it about two thirds through the season. Why can't why can't football? I don't get it. I, I, it's better than it used to be. It was way too early in the season before. So I guess I'm I'm spoiled in that regard. <laughs> uh, Mike, you've said it all. Follow Mike on NFL Network, uh, where he does the damn thing every single day. Almost every single hour, they won't let him stop. See, they got him because they put the studio. They're, get, they're in getting his me house. today. We've got a, uh, we got a, we got a, a, a Twitter. We got the insiders coming up in eight minutes. Great. Um, we've Check got, that out. Uh, uh, Where on Twitter NFL spaces. channel, NFL fast. I don't. NFL it's plus. It's YouTube NFL, and then a whole bunch of fast. <laughs> Sell it, Mike. Uh, TV <laughs> streaming services that I'm not hip to. Um, Check out the insiders. Uh, what else? Great. I got, I, got a, I, got a twi- I got a Twitter spaces tonight with James Palmer and Dallas Goddard. Going to be a lot of Phillies talk on, on that mm. one, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think I'm actually ch- – I am chained to this. Yeah, this squeeze area. some I, family I, time I, in if you, uh, if you can, or unless you don't choose to. 
<laughs> Thank you, Mike. Well, she was in she was in the room for the last segment of uh, NFL Now and <laughs> shockingly didn't make any sounds. Wow. <laughs> See, she's a pro, too. They learn quickly. Mike Garofalo, thank you, buddy. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Let's take a break, and we'll preview the first game of Week 8. The NFL is headed to Germany for the first time. Yeah! And you could get in on the action. We're sending one lucky fan plus three guests to Munich to watch Tom Brady and the Bucks take on DK Metcalf and the Seahawks. Up, making the catch. Winning fans will enjoy a week in Munich that also features a Bayern Munich European football match. No purchase necessary. To enter and for rules, visit NFL.com slash Munich sweepstakes. All right, we're back. The last thing Mark said to us before we came back on the air was questioning whether he's having a stroke potentially because the lights. Well, no, they, I mean, the lights suddenly appear to have gotten like 40% brighter. Don't go but, toward the light. So I'm just thinking maybe I'm having one of those like brain things that people have and suddenly you can smell mm. like something burning in the forest. Um, how many more untoward digs of my jets will you have in you for the balance of today's episode? I, I, th I find um, what you're saying I ridiculous. I am attempting to. Because I cannot. I have been backing the Jets in my um, Friday fun show locks. I've been telling you all along I find them fun to watch, that there's a lot going on here. Right. I experienced a Browns team that went out, went from nowhere to win a playoff game, and I'm telling you not to lose faith. Right. And you're translating anything anyone says about the Jets as a personal slight toward you, which is not correct. I've clocked it. I've I know, clocked. Peg me. What was that? I know, but don't peg me. <laughs> what? Totally unnecessary sound <laughs> dropped right there. I've clocked it. It's fine. You're right. You have been largely positive toward the team. but I. It would I, help, Greg, if occasionally you stepped in to uh, add I'm some Switzerland. fact. I know. I know you are. I know you That's are. That's his new That's move. That's me. Right. That's his new move. Um, <laughs> all right. Let's get to Thursday Night Football. I think it might be with Greg. If they destroy each other. Then I could go 53 you, every day. You guys. This yeah, is solo. Ridiculous. Sort of like an a NPR type, an NPR Greg show. Just no. goes, you know. I, Switzerland I can be all it. alone forever. Fresh air with Greg Rosenthal. Fresh air with, in Switzerland with Greg <laughs> Rosenthal. <laughs> Thursday night football. The Ravens at Buccaneers. Should be a great game. Exclusively on Prime Video. Also on NFL Plus on your streaming devices. And yet, Mark, Mark, every Buccaneers game is not a great game. Mm. I don't enjoy watching the Bucs. And it's not because I don't like Tom Brady. It's like I don't like watching Tom Brady and this offense. And now the defense isn't playing well either. And it's just like, what do you like about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? So the Ravens on the road feeling good about the visitors in this game. Until I see otherwise, I feel good about the opponent against the Bucs. You? I do because it, I did kind of enjoy watching a Panthers team that everyone left for dead um, post trading Christian McCaffrey run for 173 yards, 6.4 yards per carry against Tampa and they're totally shattered injury battered secondary because once they got past shattered and batted level one and two, it was just free spaces, open prairie land. So their secondary is still uh, really hurt. Really banged up. They're depleted, and I don't. They're not the same defense right now. They can't operate the same way. And if they start getting scored on, they're not an offense that can play from behind because they can't play when they're ahead or behind right now. And I think there is a level mm. of intrigue to the Bucks because of how disjointed their offense is right now. And you're seeing Brady. I think visually and emotionally wondering why he's here doing this at this point. And probably he's not because he's Tom Brady, but there's something different about him. And it starts with the fact that the offense scored three points last week. That's happened five times in his career that they've scored three or fewer points in 20 plus years. I'm trying to think of them. There was that week one against the Bills that got shut out. And yeah, there aren't there aren't many. There was that game against the Saints last year. That might be the three. Right. It's more recent, I think, with some of them. Uh, the, it, this is a good example of how teams change pretty dramatically within the season quickly. Like we're at week seven and these teams have had different identities. You're right. The Buccaneers defense isn't as good. And the rush defense, especially it's surprising. Or just hurt. I'm saying you're right. And there Carlton Davis hasn't been practicing this week. Akeem Hicks, who remember him, uh, who hasn't played at all for them might return uh, for them. 
But the defense feels like a little bit of a distraction. Basically, any number that you look at, they're top five, six. Like, they're fifth in points allowed and 26th in points scored. The defense has been fine. It hasn't been dominant, but it's been fine. This is an offensive team that struggle, and that's where I'm getting about teams evolving. Like, the Ravens started out the year with a ton of explosive passing plays and a really poor-looking running game, and now they flip. They don't have the explosive passing game. But the offensive line has really come together, and you're springing Kenyon Drake for big runs. Gus Edwards added a lot of juice. And so that evolution for their offense, I think, sets up well this week against the Bucks' run defense. And then you you look at the flip side, like th- there's just not anything that the Bucks can hold on to with, with Brady and Mike Evans and Godwin. That's where the miscommunication and the bad throws are often happening. It's not with, like, these secondary players. It's with Brady – and Evans and Godwin, and that is confusing to me. And the Ravens' defense, uh, speaking of evolution, like they're playing a lot better now. We talked uh, early in the year how they're really struggling. They look pr- quite good, I would say, for three or four weeks. They've gotten their act together. Well, how about look at it from this perspective then? If the issue with the Bucks is Tom Brady, Chris Godwin, and Mike Evans not being quite on the same page, maybe that's the best-case scenario almost Like because those guys have such a cr- track record that – They'll figure it out unless there's something else going on, unless we're talking some real gradual decline that's sneaking up on certain uh, guys connected to this team, that they will get better. They will find the lock-in. Mike Evans is never going to drop a pass like that again, and they get back on track. But we're deep enough now into the season, Mark, where I kind of need to see it. I need to see the Bucks look like the Bucks again before I could just say, oh, they'll snap out of it. Yeah, because this is not the first two months that Tom Brady has played with Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. I guess the Chris Godwin, you know, we talked about it on our Sunday show that he doesn't look the same right now. All right. But still, the idea that, like, the Mike Evans um, gratuitous drop he had at the start of that last game, that's what everyone's mentioning. But if you go watch that contest, he he had a bunch of targets and a bunch of passes that went to him where they weren't on sync together. And so it's like, why is that not working right now? And again, I want to – I can't believe I'm saying this because I I don't – I didn't, wouldn't have thought this. I really think that there's something missing with the shift away from Bruce Arians here. I just do. And maybe there's a way to prove it, but it's like you handed it to everyone but Arians. You wanted him out of there. That was probably Tom Brady's doing behind the scenes. And I don't know if it's like how the meetings go in the setup to these games, the aura that Bruce Arians brought. I don't know what he's doing with him week to mm. week. He's still in the building, but it could be game planning and in-game play Didn't calling. They, this Byron Leftwich um – is the offensive coordinator, right? He's been around for right. there, too. And this but is not – they didn't install a new offense. No, they, the uh, whole idea was Leftwich and right. Brady so kind of froze Arians out well, of the great there game is, planning. There I'm is just a, saying from a total team angle, too, Sure. Though. Something seems off. I, I think that's I think that's fair. Um, but also, like, it's hard <laughs> because there were reports around Bruce Arians that he was a little bit checked out by the end. And, and Tom Brady, who's always been all in in his – uh, NFL playing days, they were butting heads over some philosophies or maybe some disconnected way, like who's all in, who's not all in. So to say now that Bruce was the secret sauce, maybe he was, trying to say, like, but what, it is a difference what between. Is, what's the vast difference between last year's team? And the, this is one group that essentially, you know, Super Bowl. The, Tom Brady could year. say there's a lot of differences between this year and last year, and I'm not just talking about the scheme. No, there could be a, it could be his line too, to some degree, but it could be his personal life. It could be all sorts of things. But, yeah. uh, but I think that they're, they're an aging team, things. and so many players are hurt. They're aging, especially on offense. They're now a couple years away from that Super Bowl, and it's just it's a gradual decline, uh, almost as a team. And and I do worry about this matchup here because I think the the Ravens are good at getting pass rush in their interior line, and that's where the Bucks have struggled to protect. Uh, Gadecki might be benched now, the rookie uh, guard who's struggled. They've kind of been rotating him, and now he's hurt, so he might be out. And and I mentioned the Ravens' defense playing better. I Weirdly, Patrick Queen seems like the most important player on their defense. He's either the worst player on the field for stretches, he's incredibly streaky and a huge problem in getting benched, or he'll have little stretches in the last three weeks or one of them where he's on fire, where he's seen where everything is coming from, where he's who Devin White is supposed to be, and he's playing great right now, and they seem like they have a few more playmakers on their defense than, than, than the Bucks really have on their offense. Well, we, we talked a little bit about uh, Baltimore and, uh, and Lamar Jackson, who's kind of having a strange season. You said his running game has never been better. Here's a little stat to back that up. He has 510 rushing 
yards through seven games, which is more than the Bucks have all season. Uh, all <laughs> their players, crazy. yeah, 451. Also more than the Rams, so 423. He's also only thrown three touchdowns in four weeks against four picks. So the passing game, as we said, is stalled a little bit. The running game continues to be a big part of what Baltimore does. Uh, I like the Ravens in this by uh, a field goal. You? I so had three nothing will be the score. Three zip. <laughs> okay. Three zip win. I'm gonna hope for some points here for Kirk and Al. Uh, let's go 26. 22 Ravens. I don't worry about Kirk Kirk and Al are making an absolute hill of money. They're fine no matter what happens on the field. So have a nice evening. But but worried about Kirk. He's, you know, we talked about that. But Al don't care. Al fine. Al's, Al, Al is fine. all right. Yeah. I think we would need to be rooting for more of an Al spinoff into madness, which is We need Mark Andrews to be healthy. He played last week, didn't have a single catch. Like, they are so thin. They need to make a trade, and may- maybe they will this week. See, I don't trust them. They, they can trade for a wide receiver, and I don't know Ooh. if it changes who they are on offense. Maybe they will uh, this week on this very podcast. You know what would be cool, by the way? On this show. Same. You know what would be cool? Do you know something we don't know? I do. Um. You know what I was just thinking? If we continue to do this show for, you know, years, Mark Sessler in the Al Michaels zone in about 20 minutes. Four <laughs> about 20 <laughs> minutes. 2042. 2042. I could see, see it. I could see it. What? I'll just spin off. I, I don't have a political hot takes. So I, maybe I would by then. No, no, I'm saying yeah. in that, uh, and I look forward kind to this. Kind of the DJF thing. zone. Yeah, like just completely I think that is, um, ve- off like, the res. I think you could be much more aggressive when that will happen than right. 2042. He, I'd Mark say will be not, 69 years old in 2042. Yeah. 2024. I will, I'll be as free-flowing as you could possibly imagine. <laughs> or I'll just be a robot by then. <laughs> well, the, the Mark bot is heating up. The Mark bot, we're, we're filling, we filled up an entire hard drive now for the the Mark AI bot. So I have 41. 41. <laughs> Unbelievable. Mark bot crazy. Drops. That's more than I actually say in a show. So. But we need to get that up to 100,000. <laughs> I mean, that's the goal by the end of, let's say, the 2023 season. Copy that. Yeah. That's just something to shoot. When we sit down with Justin and we have our uh, end of year conversation where we give out his grades and mm-hmm. uh, discuss with him his future because uh, that's one of our tasks at the company. I have a grade for him. His grades? <laughs> <laughs> I what do they call it? A progress with report? my wife and two <laughs> small children and utterly destroyed them on the court. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know, we've talked about like the uh, religious episode. What, oh, yeah. What did we call it? Uh, that is like the, the, the theology, theology podcast, podcast. And that's yeah. coming. Uh, and we have a lot of exciting podcasts coming in the off season. But we truly are going to have the Dan Gregg and Mark Bot episode this offseason. We are going to make like it that. happen when Mark's out of town and just see how it goes. Let's give Justin a shot as we sign off for the episode. Uh, what do you got on the what do you got on the Do you care about my frame? pick for this game? Oh. Uh, <laughs> I think you can read it. Heavens to Betsy. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say 20 nothing Ravens. All right, give, 20 to nothing. All right, give us some bot. I am absolutely excited about what's occurring. Yeah. I think no, I no, we, think so. no, we're giving Justin the floor. I'm leaving. <laughs> you know, you two <laughs> are unbelievably <laughs> un- annoying to hang out with most of the time. <laughs> Who said this podcast doesn't have sex appeal? Well, who you are is terrible. <laughs> what are you talking about? All right, that's you're enough. gone. I, see, I, I'm, I'm imagining me, you, in real life talking to Mark's bot. Three, well, three well, bots. Well, that's gonna happen for real. Yeah, three bots uh, would be. You yeah, said one episode. Yeah. Hey, 420, bro. <laughs> a triple bot Time app would to be. Go. Think about it. If we do a triple bot app, the only person that actually has to come to work is Justin. Right. You can just do it at home. You could do it at home, though. Right. That's a that's a little peek into our future when we really uh, finger check looking out. good. <laughs> That's that gets grosser every time. All right, uh, we got plenty of more great content coming up this week, so keep your eyes trained to your feed of around the NFL. Thank you to Mike Garofolo for his insight, as always, chained to the chair in his basement. Tough sitch, but they pay him. Pleasant so guest. I really like Mike G. I lot. always like Mike. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's a paisan, as they say. Mm-hmm. Great. He's a dude. good fella. Came up. The hard way and the hard scrabble 
streets of the Bergen record. I don't know, I'm just making that up. Newark Star Ledger. Close. Yeah, I think in that realm. Yeah. Um, all right. Thanks to everybody uh, for listening. Uh, until we meet again. That realm. That realm. North Jersey. We tell you to do what you need to do. Heave the call.